A few years ago, I found my late grandfather's World War II journal, and in the process, found 11 airmen that served with him. I went around the country and interviewed him and put together a documentary. We got to tour the film and folks got to hear their stories. What a ride. I was sad to see it end, but all of a sudden, two more showed up. I'd been looking on the internet for people that I'd served with. I, I guess I was probably on one of the veterans sites and pulled it up somehow or another. I, I ran across this thing of uh, Air Group 11, the movie. I'm sitting in the back seat of a SPD-4, like I flew down in Guadalcanal in 1943. It's to get back to do something that I did when I was 18 years old. And now being 92, it's, uh, it's quite an experience. The machine guns had 1,100 rounds in each side that fed up into the chambers of the machine gun. And the, the sight had two circles around and we, to tell distance, uh, we would get the plane in the center and then say elephant. That was supposed to be one second. And that one second, if he went all the way to the other rim in that period of time, you knew he was out 300 yards or beyond. So that's the way we did it and uh, very scientific, but it's quite an experience. See, this is why you had to have the gunner's belt. This is the way, when you were in combat, you had to uh, get up like this and uh, aim down and let her go. But it takes a little bit of getting used to the barrels, where the barrels are and so forth, but you do after a while. I got you. There you are, I got you in my sights. Going to blow your guts out. The first dive going backwards, it's like having the whatever you're on drop out from under you. You can't move. It just pins you in the seat. And uh, the one thing that I always noticed in some of the dives, as we're going down, the ammunition from bullets that you'd shot would come floating up in front of your face. So we were going by, by the pull of gravity. And it was all kind of strange because you reach out and grab them like this. I joined the Navy because uh, my brother was in and I had intended to go in when I got out of high school. I went in when I was 17. Um, I had five months left to go in high school, went to the principal and asked if he would give us our diploma if we went in the service. And he checked with the school board. They came back and said, yes, they would. Our squadron originally was scouting 11. And then they decided to change us to bombing 21 because we were uh, doing nothing basically but bombing. So we became bombing 21 in Air Group 11. My name is O.C. Vici. O.C. Marvin Vici, that is. Almost 93 years old. I was born at Marion, Arkansas, lived off of the cotton patch. I joined the Navy when I was 16 and a half. I was that old. My job on board the aircraft was to operate the radio and the tail guns. Well, I can't see me, but I was right here. <laughs> I was right there. That's me. They wanted to get those of us who had never flown in a seat of a wild man. So I flew my first flight with uh, Jesse James Walker. That was his name. He rung it out. He took me to 14,000, which is as far as we could go. 
and he'd spin and tumble and do whatever he could do. And then I would puke right in the aircraft. I joined uh, VS-11 in October, November of 42. Uh, we changed the designation to VB-21 in March of 1943. On, the, on this patch, they have a shield and they have an Indian and the Indian is holding the bomb. With a uh, bomb in his hand, throwing the bomb, and in the background and so forth. And that was the Bombing 21 patch. Want to show it? There's the patch. Uh, the reason we ended up at Guadalcanal, we were in the Fijis and we were the uh, air group that was to replace the air group on the Hornet, which was CV-8. We had a fighter squadron, torpedo squadron, and two uh, bombing squadrons. Then when the Hornet got sunk, in this Battle of Santa Cruz, they didn't have an uh, aircraft carrier to put us on. So they put us down and put us under MacArthur's Air Force. When I got to Guadalcanal, I looked around and said, what am I doing here? It was not a very uh, delightful looking place. We had uh, for dinner every night spam and dehydrated potatoes. Powdered eggs and powdered milk and powdered this and lots of spam. I got so tired of Spam that I've never tasted it since I left. So that's 74 years and I've not had a bit of Spam since. We had a drink we call Sneaky Pete. And it was nothing more than torpedo juice that the guys had drained out of the torpedoes. Because the next day I took a drink of water and I got drunk all over again. It was bad stuff. But anyhow, the Sneaky Pete uh, the, the torpedo squadron went out the next day after that. And out of the 18 torpedo planes, only two of them dropped torpedoes that would run. The rest of them just sunk because they had drained all the alcohol out of them. Now, washing machine, Charlie, was uh, a nuisance raid that was pulled every night by the Japanese. And during the air raids, we... Uh, went to our personal foxholes that we had dug. So that's where we went during the air raids. You never knew if he was just gonna make a noise or drop a bomb. So you had to be ready to go to the foxhole. During monsoon season, the water collects in the tents and our tent had water almost up to the canvas in the uh, cots. So what my partner and I did was we took a shovel and drained our tent into the foxhole next to us. So when washing machine Charlie came over, they hit the foxhole and it was full of water. One night, I'm not gonna get up. So I stayed in bed. Pretty soon, one of the guys in the thing hollered, Dick, you better get out of there. So I jumped up and was just in the entrance, the final entrance into the shelter, and a bomb went off, a 100-pound bomb, and it threw me bodily right through the air about eight feet, and I landed on three guys sitting across the, the thing. So from that time on, I got out of bed and went to the shelter. Guadalcanal had uh, several countries represented. They had P-40 squadron, was made up of Aussies and uh, New, New Zealanders. And they gave us cover on occasion. The other forces that I knew of was the CVs, and we had the Marines. There was a lot of, uh, there was B-17s, B-24s, and they were all the Air Force. Uh, June 5, 1943, yes, the day that we were shot down. The squadron had already made their dive at, at uh, Kahili Harbor. We were diving transports. And so Larson and I was last. And when we came out of the dive, there were several zeros waiting for us. The zeros made pass after pass, and you believe it or not, that Dauntless could move. The old uh, CT kept it 
floorboarded, losing all the zeros but one as we went through the trees on Santa Isabel. They got the best of us, they filled us full of holes. Canopy, the pilot's canopy, and then the radio direction finder canopy, and then my canopy, and then the tail. Larson called me and said, uh, Otsie, we're gonna have to ditch. <laughs> that meant I'm gonna put the plane in the water. We wanted to get it deep enough that the plane would sink and not be seen. And when Larson set the plane down, that I got out and got the raft, then I rode around to the other side of the plane and Larson stepped off the plane into the raft. When we got to shore, we uh, decided that we better find shelter for the night. The next morning, we started walking we ran across a native cutting wood. Then he brought us up to the tent and we got a guy named Kennedy. He was a coast watcher. So we spent the night with him and, and the next day we bummed a ride in a canoe loaded with bananas and we started towards Guadalcanal. And during that time, we could hear the PBY coming. CT got the uh, very pistol and started shooting in the, in the air so that they could see the flares. That's how we notified the PBY that we were friends and we were looking for a ride, I guess. <laughs> on June 5th, 1943, I deemed the worst day of my life and the best day of my life. The first daylight raid on Bougainville. Bougainville was 600 miles away well, that morning we went down, got in our airplane, started it up and it caught on fire. We jumped out of it, went over and started looking for another plane because we didn't want to miss the raid. So we got in and took off. So then we got up over Bougainville. There was about 20 zeros above us flying around. I looked for the gunner's belt, there's no gunner's belt. Uh, the group commander, which is flying a torpedo plane, told our skipper, drop over and bomb this ship that was down below us. Anyhow, we did, and when he put the plane over, the guns broke loose from the mount, and I'm hanging onto the guns. So it drags me up out of the airplane, and I'm kicking with my feet as fast as I can, trying to get my feet on one of those rungs that we had down underneath, and I caught the top one. So I was out of the airplane about two-thirds of the way, hanging on with my toes, we're in a vertical dive. And uh, I, all I can think of is you can't let go of these guns or they'll rip the tail off. So I hung on and we pulled up, heard something that didn't sound right. So I looked out the side of the plane and uh, I got a gobble of oil on my face. So then I realized we'd been hit. While we were in the dive, uh, Beck and Henderson, I saw them go by me in a dive, vertical dive with no flaps. And uh, the SBD, when it got to a certain speed, would not pull out from a dive. And uh, they went down and I saw them hit the water. And that was the end of them. And uh, being 18 years old, I had to have some logic for it. So I said, well, at least it was the uh, the guy that was 30 years old, he had a chance to live some life before he died. He wasn't one of the young kids like I was. And that's the way you rationalize it. You just, you had to. So the pilot says, well, let's try the Russells. That's about another 100 miles. Maybe we can get there, and, and that's a hill by uh, us. So we were going along, and pretty soon two zeros showed up. I got six shots off, but during the time I was in the air, wind had whipped the ammunition around the belt and both belts were all jammed up so they wouldn't fit through the gun. I had to do something. I, I was sitting there and these guys were coming in at so I pulled out radio coils and I was throwing radio coils at them and I threw the Aldous lamp at them which is a signal lamp. Anything I could get that I could throw I threw at them. I don't know why but I thought maybe you'd get lucky and hit the <laughs> pilot or something. 
I saw these two F4Us up there and I, I went on the radio, you're not supposed to go over the air without code, but I did. I said, the heck with that. So I called them and said, get over here, we need help. So they came over and uh, the Japanese uh, took off. And we went on down and that night at dinner, we found the two guys that had saved us. And one guy says, well, I was clear out of ammunition and he only had 50 rounds. So that was a lucky day. And when I got back, all of my possessions were divided up. We had a deal among us. Anytime anybody was lost, you divide up all our things that they own. And we had a deal where money uh, was to be go into a pot. And then when we got back to the States, we'd have a celebration. So anyhow, I got over there and everything was gone. I had to go around and try to find everything I owned. It was all scattered around. And I finally got it. And then uh, later on, we did go to St. Francis Hotel and spent a week there in San Francisco uh, on the money that was left over from the guys that got killed and, and uh, didn't make it. When we were told that the air group was going to go back to the States, it was on my 19th birthday, July 28, 1943. I couldn't believe it. So we left the next day and it had been torpedoed. And uh, the uh, torpedo had gone right in the stern, half in, half out, it didn't blow up. So they'd leave it in, caulk around it and bring it back. So we, we could only go 10 knots on it because of that torpedo. So I played bridge for 10 days and we used that torpedo as our table. We had, uh, it, it was pretty good size, you know, when it went over like that. But at the end of the 10 days, I owed $50. <laughs> Richard Morales, everything I know about Dick is a story. <laughs> the thing is, is when you get a, a mix of sailors, everyone has a different trait. Richard was a, an athlete, and me, I was a chaser. And, uh, but he and I headed off as good friends, and we stayed that way until, well, in fact, uh, he contacted me uh, after we separated, after the war was over and all. Uh, Dick, he would always either write or call or... And that looks like Dick right there. <laughs> oh, see. I got looking in my book the other day, and of the people I loaned money to on Guadalcanal, you it still owe me $5. Yeah, you were. Your how name's in the you? list. How much I owe you? $5. Well, I've been out of the Navy so long, I haven't got any <laughs> money left. <laughs> me either. <laughs> he was just asking me a, a question. Yeah. Of what would I say? I could dang fine know. It's uh, unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, we're both here. How about that? And we both went down on the same day, remember? Well, how about that? Yeah. How about 73? 73 years. That long? Yep. We were both 18. <laughs> that the fun we had. Yep. It was fun. <laughs> oh, yeah. They set you up is what they did. Oh. They didn't want you to know I was here. Oh. So they've been hiding me out in the hotel room. Well, I came from California. You did? Yeah. Just to catch them? No, to see you. <laughs> yeah, I flew from California to Huntsville, Alabama, just to meet my old buddy, OCVC. 